Amen. Praise the Lord. We're, we're in the middle of a series, uh, a mini-series called uh, Revive, and um, we are, when I, I was uh, growing up in Kentucky, uh, the little church that I grew up in, we had a spring revival every year. Anybody else grow up in a church that had spring revivals? I mean, it was, it was just automatic. I mean, you just might as well, um, just might as well set your clock by it, set your calendar by it. Every year about this time, we had a spring revival. In fact, I talked to my mom and dad last night, and they are in the middle of a spring revival right now. <laughs> and they still go to the same church. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we're not actually going to have a revival where we're coming to church every night, but we're going to talk about it for three weeks. <laughs> Uh, because I, I honestly believe that in this, this time of the year, we probably need it more than any other time because, you know, we've, we've come through the holidays and, and we get into this long period where there really is no breaks. I mean, I know we're, we're in probably, in, some of your kids are getting ready to go on spring break, but there, there's no holidays. It's just the grind. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The real grind where you are just there's just nothing in sight, you know, uh, no, no end in sight. And, and it's easy to get overcome with the busyness of the grind and just forget about God or maybe not just forget about him, but put him on the back burner for a while. And uh, I, 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 it made so much sense to me now that I'm pastoring why people have a spring revival, why churches do a spring revival. And before I get started today, I don't know who this is for, but I was driving into church today, and I just heard the Holy Spirit drop this in my, in, in my heart this morning. And if this is for you, just reach out and take it. If it's not for you, then just go, well, he ain't talking to me. <laughs> but here's what the Holy Spirit said to me this morning. He said, um, and this has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about, Happiness doesn't come from getting your prayers answered. Now, I don't know who that's for, but some of you have been believing for some things and, and praying for some things, and stuff gets dropped in your lap, and actually some of you have gotten your prayers answered and you still aren't happy. And you were asking God, oh God, if I could just have this, if I could just see that, if I could just do that. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. I've had the big blessing get dropped in your lap before. And I still wasn't happy. And there's somebody sitting in here today that you uh, have, have asked for something and, and the Lord blessed you and it's still, uh, you're still thinking you're not happy and that you're just asking for more. You're asking for, well, I was wrong about that. I need this now. Or, and I'm not talking about money and I'm not talking about, you know, uh, material things as much as I am just talking about things in general. Some of you have been asking for a new job. I'm going to tell you right now, if you got the new job, you still aren't going to be happy. I don't know who this is for. This is not in my notes. <laughs> Some of you have been asking for a, a better spouse. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, that, that's not going to make you happy. Some of you have been asking for some stuff, and you need to stop asking for some stuff and start asking for more of God. The Bible says that, you know, happy is the man who finds wisdom. That's the only place in the Bible that says you're going to be happy. The rest of the time, we're supposed to be fighting. Now, does that mean we're supposed to be fighting each other? No, we're supposed to be fighting the good fight of faith. And I'm just going to tell you, that's not always fun, is it? Fighting the good fight of faith is, I wish we didn't have to. But if I'm going to be happy in my life, then I need to go and find wisdom. And the Bible actually tells us how to get wisdom. It says, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Meaning what? You want some happiness in your life? Stop looking for the stuff. Start asking him. Lord, make me wise. Now, I don't know who that's for, but if that's you, just reach out and take it. All right? So we're going to get back on the series now. We've been talking about Revive for the last week now. Last week I said to you, if we're going to have revival in our lives, which actually the word revive means to restore back to life or consciousness. To restore back to life or consciousness. And um, <clears throat> I said that to you last week. 
that the first step to restoring your life back, uh, restoring back to life or consciousness has to come from the fact that you accept the fact that you belong to God. You're not going to have life, and the, the way Jesus said we could have it, life more abundantly. Uh, you're not going to have that unless you realize you belong to God. Now, let's just go back for a second here, and I'm not going to re-preach my message last week. I'm going to give you something a little extra. Is that okay? If you go back and look in the Garden of Eden when God said to them, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Did they die as soon as they ate it? Physically speaking, they did not die. So he must have been talking about something else. He was talking about spiritually or being separated from God. And, and, and that was what he was talking about. If you eat of this tree, you're going to be separated from me. Separated. But then Jesus came back and, and reversed all that. Jesus came to the earth, died on the cross, rose again, and restored our relationship and our fellowship with God. And uh, when he did that, and you accept that, you actually belong to him now. You're not your own. The Bible, the Bible actually says you're bought with a price. Now, we don't like to think about it that way because we don't think, well, ain't nobody own me. And that's true. God doesn't own you like a possession. He, he's yours like a parent. You can still go do whatever you want to do. You can still go live however you want to live. And, and I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, he's not sitting there with a tack hammer waiting on you to screw up so he can bash you over the head. He's, you go right ahead. Do whatever you want to do. But if you really want to experience the fullness of life, the way Jesus said, I, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly, the only way you can do that is to realize you belong to him. He's yours. Now, some of you saw my little boy Preston over here this morning. He's pulling the pastor's kid card this morning. I don't really want to go to children's church this morning. I'm tired. So guess what he did? He pulled that on Donna. <laughs> I'm going to go over and be with my mom and dad. You know, my dad's the pastor. <laughs> he knows who he belongs to. And so that doesn't make it right. And if you notice, Jody's already walked out with him. He's probably on his way back over there. <laughs> But in his little, his little understanding and his thinking, uh, that makes perfect sense to him. Your kids probably make, that probably makes perfect sense to, th to, to them for you. They want to come be with you. They don't care who's standing. That's my mom. That's my dad. That's the way you have to approach God. I, I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care if anybody else wants to tell me that God's not real or people that pray are weak or, or anything else that, that people want to say to me. I belong to the God that created the universe. I belong to the God that made everything. He's mine. I'm his. And that's the first step of having revival happen in your life. Now, if you already have a relationship with Jesus, and we throw that, that around a lot here, um, and we probably ought to take some more time to, to, uh, to explain that, but basically Jesus came, died, and rose again, and if you will believe that and accept that, now you have a relationship with him. Now, we want to get all hung up on giving up this and giving up that, and you got to stop doing this first, and you got to stop doing that first. You don't got to stop doing anything in order to go and have a relationship with Jesus. He's the one that will help you stop all that mess. You want, to come, you want to come and have a relationship with Jesus? Great. Let's go have a relationship with Jesus. Let him deal with you on all that stuff. All the things you got going on in your life, uh, he's the one that helps you get out of it. So how do I have a relationship with Jesus? You accept him as Lord and Savior of your life. What, do I, what, am I, what is he Lord of? He's in charge. He's calling the shots. What is he saving me from? Hell. <laughs> Eternal damnation. Boy, that's awful scary. You shouldn't talk like that. Listen, if you would hate me if you, you, you got to hell and, and you realized uh, that it was real. <laughs> Why didn't somebody tell me? You can't say that now. <laughs> he saved us from that. We don't have to go there. And if you have a relationship with him, you've already 
been, had the first part of revive, revival happen. You've been restored to life. But now you're a Christian. And uh, sometimes when we're Christians and, and we have this walk, and I'm sure there's plenty of people in here that could testify to this, you have to be, now you don't have to be restored to life because you're alive, but sometimes you need to be restored back to consciousness. If you've, been a, if you've been a Christian for any length of time at all, you've fallen asleep at the wheel, and don't, don't look at me like you haven't. We've been on autopilot. Come on now. If I could just, you know, read my Bible mechanically and pray mechanically. Listen to me, that's not a relationship, that's religion. And we don't, we don't have religion. We have a relationship with a living God. So really, what we're talking about here this morning, and if you don't know Jesus, we're going to give you an opportunity to be restored back to life. But if you know Jesus, revive needs to happen in your life too because you need to be restored back to consciousness. You need to wake up. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, that's where we're going to start at this morning. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. Now, if, you're, if you are electronically inclined and you have the version app on your, on your phone, I did put it in there this week, didn't I? I, may have not, I didn't put it in there. Never mind. <laughs> Started thinking about that just now. We had car trouble yesterday. We bought, just bought Jody a brand new car. And uh, she called me and goes, it, it won't go. And I'm like, what do you mean it won't go? Like it's, I'm sitting, I'm sitting at McDonald's on 192, and it won't go faster than 20 miles an hour. So I had to leave and and go and give her my car so she could take the boys and go do something fun. And I sat there for four hours waiting on the tow truck. Yeah, no fun, no fun. That's why there's no notes in there now. <laughs> just, uh, I just never remembered that. That's why we don't have the uh, U version notes today. Uh, normally it's really cool. Ephesians chapter five. Verse number 10, that means some of you that bring your paper Bible and never open them, you can open them today. Um, <laughs> look at what verse number 10 says. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Oh, man, that's heavy already, isn't it? Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness Instead, expose them. Man, we're going to go heavy today, aren't we? It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions are exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. Now catch this part. This is why it is said... Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, this is a heavy scripture, but it's written to Christians. This is written to us. Turn to the person next to you and say, this was written to you. Now, why do we need to be restored back to consciousness? Why do we need to be woken up? What is it about a Christian that is so important? I mean, why, I mean I'm not anybody special. Why do I got to wake up? Why can't everybody just leave me alone? Let me just drift peacefully through life. And I, I'm not going to bother anybody. I'm not going to hurt anybody. I'm not going to. Uh, what difference does it make? Listen, God wants all of us awake because when we are awake, Christ gives us light. And us, that, that light is the only way somebody else is going to know that they're wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that we walk around and go, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Hey, did you know you're wrong? Hey, hey, you better stop doing that, you're wrong. That's not what it means. That means the fact that you walk in the room and people suddenly see themselves differently just from you walking in the room. Why? Because there's light shining out of you. <laughs> you better catch this. 
It is not about us condemning the world. Listen, if Jesus didn't come to the world, he says, I, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. If Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, he didn't send you out in the world to condemn the world. That's not what this means. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to walk out and point out everybody else's sins. Listen, I don't know about you, but I was always taught that if you point your finger at somebody, you got three of them pointing right back at you. Come on now. We're not supposed to walk out and just and, and harp on what everybody's doing. But the very presence of you being around somebody that is in sin, they ought to feel different. And if they don't, what does that mean? We're asleep. Come on, somebody. There was, a, there was a, st a story about Smith Wigglesworth, one of the most famous and powerful men of God since the, the Apostle Paul. And he's sitting on the bus reading his pocket New Testament, not talking to anybody, not saying anything to anybody, not preaching, not, you know, not firing brimstone, you better turn or burn, none of that. He's sitting there reading his pocket New Testament and all of a sudden, this guy looks at him and stands up and walks away and then turns around and comes back and goes, you convict me of sin and walked away. That's what I'm talking about. Anybody ever been around people that cuss like crazy and they apologize to you? <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> they, they, they say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Excuse my language. This is what this scripture is talking about. And this is why revival needs to happen. Whether you want to accept it or you think I'm real, oh, he's not really talking to me. I'm too quiet and I'm too shy and I'm too backwards. You don't want to accept it. That's okay. God's calling you to shine light out in the world. And this is what you need revival for. We're encouraged by Paul here to come back to consciousness. And this happens all too often. We grow laxed in our walk with God. We, we just kind of put it on cruise control. Autopilot. You know what I mean? And when that happens, our faith gets weak because we stop feeding it. We allow our walk with God to become second or third we skip church because we want to go to the beach you could have gone all day without saying that <laughs> we don't go to small groups because well we just don't really feel like it and I don't feel like being social <laughs> I'm not looking at anybody I'm looking at the floor The funny thing about it is, is anything else we could sacrifice, we won't sacrifice anything else, but we'll sacrifice going to church. We'll sacrifice reading our Bibles. We'll sacrifice praying. I don't really have time to read the Bible. I've had a full day today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lay down and go to sleep. Well, I, you know, I overslept today. I don't really have time to read the Bible. And I, Come on now. Don't get quiet. Now, people know I'm talking to you then. We get laxed in our walk with God. And we, get, we have weak faith because we've stopped feeding it. We allow our, our walk with God to grow cold. We start putting him second. We start putting him third. And it really, it's not like we rose up one day and just said, hey, I'm going to put God second. It's just being overwhelmed with everything else. We allow ourselves to start accepting sin. This is okay. God understands. But let's take it a step further. We start allowing ourselves to accept worry and anxiety. Well, you know, I'm human, and it's... You're asleep. Listen, I get it. I understand it. I've sat and looked at, at the bank account when it didn't have anything in it. I know what that feels like. I know what it's like to go to the doctor and have them tell you something. I know what that's like. That's no fun. That does make you want to, what's going on here? And when we're asleep, 
we start allowing that to just creep in a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And, and we just, you know, people say something to us that we could take it the wrong way. We start accepting the fact that we're not going to walk in love with anybody else. Somebody says one thing to us that can be taken a certain way. Uh, w next thing you know, we formulated a whole reason of why they hate us and why I'm going to, to go and declare war on them. Boy, it's awful quiet in here this morning. These are the times that we need revival the most. And we usually see revival as happening for people who are in sin or people who are sick. There's usually a, a healing revival or, a, or a, a revival where people come running back to God. But listen, it's more than that. Revival, God wants revival to happen in more than just the sinner and in more than just the sick. He wants revival to happen in the body of Christ. Any place that your flesh can rear its ugly head, we need revival in. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 5 says, We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. What happens if we don't? Well, the next thing we know, we become people that don't look like Christians. We're, 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 we might be awake as far as being alive, but we're not awake when it comes to the power of God. And let me just say this. Just because you talk about wanting to have the power move in your life doesn't mean that you're awake. Anybody can talk a good game. Listen, when I was at, when I was at Rama as a, as a Bible school instructor, you saw thousands of students walk around and talk a good game. I mean, how you doing today? Oh, blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Beating their wife and, and stealing from work. Act all drunk in the Holy Ghost at church and, and out smoking weed and drinking with their friends. Anybody can talk a good game. We're not talking about talking a good game. We're talking about living the game. And if you've got areas in your life that you need to, to put some things down in, this is, what revi this is where revival needs to happen. People that come in and, and talk about talk about you know uh, they're gonna they're they're gonna make it and 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 they're believing God for their tuition and and they're believing for there are all these kind of things to happen and yet they're going home and getting in the fetal position on the floor and crying and worrying and saying oh God what am I going to do I'm not going to be able to make it I've seen it that's an area they need revival in God is calling us back to putting him first place in our lives. He is the answer to your problems. He is the satisfaction to your temptation. He is the cure for your sin. God is the revival that you need. So let's go to our, our main text, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. And we're going to look at this recipe. If my people, which are called by my name, that's what we talked about last week, we're Christians we're called by his name, Christians. Hello. We're his people. We belong to him. Now let's get on with it. Shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And I want everybody to pay attention to this one today because this one's real, real, real important. You've got to realize your gods and you belong to him and you're called by his name. You're a Christian. But the next one is this says, humble themselves. Here it is. You want revival to happen in your life so that God shines out of you like he, you're, you're supposed to have happen, like God wants you to happen? You need to get over yourself. Amen. You just, you need to get over yourself. In order for God to move in your life, you, you cannot be all about you. I've said this here before, and I'm actually, I'm working on a book right now, and I've never written a book in my life, and I'm working on one, and I wrote this in there, I was, I was working on it this week, and I put this statement in there, and I, I, like I said, I've said it here before, but here it is, it's important, faith 
cannot live in the arrogant heart. You think you're all that? You are. <laughs> it's just you. <laughs> you are all that. <laughs> That's it. There's no faith in your heart. Faith cannot live in an arrogant heart. You think you're all that? You're out there by yourself. You think you got it going on? Well, it is. It's just all you. There's no help. We really need to understand that our world and our life only has good things in it because God is so good. The human race has a history of thinking that we got it all figured out. I mean, wasn't it in like 1902? The patent office closed and said, everything that's ever been invented has been invented. We don't need to issue any more patents. Now, if that's not, that's just not a great illustration of human arrogance. I mean, we're talking almost 100 years before the first computer. <laughs> they said there's nothing else going to be invented. We have a history of thinking we have it all figured out. Remember when they went to go build the Tower of Babel? They thought for sure they were going to build a tower that reached all the way to heaven. Thought they had it all figured out. How many times in our lives have we figured, this is it, I have finally arrived. Only to come crashing down around yourself <laughs> with the ashes almost laughing in your face. Proverbs chapter 26, verse number 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. When you see yourself as being that good, you're setting yourself up to fail. Has anybody ever, ever thought that? Something just happened and you just go, man... I'm good. Tell the truth. I, I, I'll tell you a funny story. I, my, my, I used to think I was the only one that thought this way until my dad had the same conversation with me. Um, what, one time, we were sitting at a, at a red light, and um, he was driving a, a Mercedes. I don't remember what model it was. It was a fast one, though. And um, he took off and, of course, left everybody at the red light and just, boom, man, we were just flying. And uh, I used to do that all the time when I had my Firebird. Now, in 1987, with the acid wash jeans, come on, somebody, and the, and the hair sprayed slick down side, come on now, and, 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 and it had just three stripes shaved right here. Anybody else? And I had the, the acid wash jacket and a black Firebird with T-tops. Man, I thought that I was the bomb. And uh, I used to do that all the time. I used to pull up to the stoplight, and I just... As soon as it turned green, hammer that thing, and down the road I'd go. And I used to think, as, as I'm driving, you know, this car is just put together a little better than anybody else's. And I used to never tell anybody else that, but I would think that. And my dad's driving down in his Mercedes, and we take off, and he goes, you know, sometimes they come from the, from the factory just put together a little bit better. And I was like, oh, my God. I thought the same thing about my car. The truth is, is we were the only ones punching the, punching the pedal down to the metal. But sometimes we are. We are arrogant to think that our world is the only one like it is. Nobody else is doing what I'm doing, so therefore I'm the only one doing it. Let me take it a step further. I'm the only one going through this kind of temptation. Come on now. That's arrogance. I'm the only one that's having this kind of warfare waged against me. Come on. Get over yourself. You are not the only person going through that problem. You are not the only one who has that addiction. You are not the only one who has good things happen in their life. You're not the only one that got a raise because of your hard work. Come on. There are a thousand things that we go through all the time that we think is just us. You need to get over yourself. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 18 says, Pride goes before destruction. Haughtiness 
before a fall. Well, now, what does that mean? What is pride? Pride is this, believing a lie about yourself. You believe a lie about yourself, you're setting yourself up to get destroyed. Now, what does that mean? That means if you're good at something, you, it's okay to believe you're good. I mean, there's, just, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if you know, I, I do voiceover work on the side. God bless me with this wonderful instrument. <laughs> I, I use it in the head. That's a little inside joke. I did a voiceover for a movie trailer, and it was terrible. Anyway, that was one of the lines I had. Uh, and so I go and do it. Now, I get hired work to do all the time. I, I do stuff all the time. I'll go in my closet with my microphone, my little laptop computer, and I'm sure Jody can hear all kinds of crazy stuff coming out. I mean, I, I, I go and do that stuff all the time. I know I'm good at it. That's okay for me to believe because that's not a lie. If I wasn't good, I wouldn't be getting work doing it. But when I start walking around going, you know, I'm the best. I am the greatest thing that's ever happened to voice acting and voiceover work. You know, you would be lucky to hire me. See, I'm believing a lie about myself. See, when you go beyond just believing something that's true to believing something that's extra, you, you are now in pride. And this is where God starts resisting you. You need to get past yourself and move on to where the goodness of God is. Many people won't worship at church because they're too proud. Let's just lift our hands and worship. Oh, that's just a waste of my time. I'm just going to sit here with my eyes closed and be somber. You're believing a lie about yourself. Some people have a relationship with God, and they'll only take it as far as they can understand. Catch this. This is for somebody in here. If you think that you can box your relationship with God into what you can understand, you've already missed the boat. God is so much bigger and vast than you will ever understand or that you will ever be able to figure out. And there have been people that have tried to box him in and say, well, God's just going to have to do it to the way I understand. Well, guess what? You're the one that's going to be standing there waiting for 20 years. This is why the children of Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years. They couldn't get past what God was asking them to do. That doesn't make sense to me. It's better for me to go back to Egypt and get in captivity again. Come on now. When God asked them to do things that they didn't understand, go ahead and hit that rock. Really? Hit the rock? Okay. Hit the rock, water comes out of it. Next time God says this, speak to the rock. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. I've already got my axe handle in, the, in my hand here. Shouldn't I just go ahead and hit this? No, just speak to the rock. I think I'm going to go ahead and hit it. Wham! Nothing happened. What happened there? They thought they knew more than what God was telling them. It was all about what they could understand and what they could do and what they could comprehend. Listen to me. God is greater than that. That's why you've got to get over yourself. It is the height of human arrogance to think that we are the reason things are good in our life or that we have figured out everything that God is supposed to be that he can't move beyond our understanding. Lots of people aren't doing what God is telling them to do because their pride won't let them. They go to work, and, and they see somebody that needs to hear an encouraging word, and they know they could walk right over and say something to them, but they go, what if I look stupid? Somebody goes and, and goes to a restaurant, and they feel that little nudge, I'm going to buy this guy behind me's lunch even though he probably would think i'm crazy and he already does because he works up two floors above me and if i bought his lunch and just blessed him he'd probably think i'm nuts so i'm not going to what is the what is the common denominator in both of these me what I, what i think i'm believing a lie about myself 
Pride is the essence of that. You are not that good. You are not that awesome. Anybody ever thought that you figured something out and you, you were so proud of yourself and you were going to go and you're like, man, I should invent this and I should patent this and, and then you go and do a search for it and it was built 12 years ago? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm going gonna, I, I, I'm gonna to tell two, two little stories here, right, and just one. All right. I, I, years ago, I, I thought of, I mean, now, now let me just tell you how long ago this was. This is like 1988. Me and my cousin driving around, we came up with this idea of a fire alarm that instead of beep, 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 it would talk to you. Like, and we were like, that's brilliant. And, you know, and we, could, we could put it in there, and, 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 and now they have it. I was so bummed when I found that out. I was like, dang it, that's my million-dollar idea. They have it now. So the other day, <clears throat> we have two little boys, and plus me, and, and so uh, there's a lot of standing up when you go into the bathroom at our house. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. And um, so um, <clears throat> not everybody has good aim. Preston's pretty good, but me and Peyton are just all over the place. I'm just kidding. But now there's a, there's a, there's a you know, some dribbling that happens. <laughs> now I'm, I'm talking to real people here, aren't I? <laughs> okay, all right. And I thought, man, why don't we just, why doesn't that just happen? And, you know, of course, those guys, I mean, it's, it's more like this. <laughs> why are they just chest level reaching up and you know and I started thinking about it how many other families and marriages would be saved right now if there was some kind of tool that if the mom went to go sit down in the middle of the night she didn't sit down in a small puddle anybody else know what I'm talking about and so then I thought I thought I thought okay why why aren't why isn't this happening and the only thing I could come up with was the fact that, well, we're just lazy. Come on, guys. Are we really lazy? Amen. Who wants to bend down there and do that? So I thought, I've got it. Let's put a foot lever on the side like a trash can. <laughs> Some of you are going, brilliant! <laughs> then I started thinking, man, you could, you could get real fancy and put like, pressure plates on this both sides and you get real fancy it's built into the floor and so when you stand there it just automatically does i was like wow this is great this is brilliant i haven't drew drew up a little blueprint of it and i was like this is going to be great and then i looked it up i was so proud of myself but it's been made already my boys wouldn't know how to use it so but there's a lot of times that we think we've got things figured out and we haven't. Somebody else figured it out a long time ago. You ever heard somebody preach something that's really good and then thought, God's given me a greater revelation on that. I don't really need to hear what he's saying. Anybody ever thought that? I've actually sat in services and been preaching my guts out and, and had some people just look up at me and, and just kind of look at me weird and then just sit back and fold their arms. And I go, yeah, I know what's coming at the door. I'll be getting some smart commentary on this, what I'm preaching. Unfold your arms. Don't <laughs> nobody think I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Looked over there, both of them had their arms closed. <laughs> but no... I've actually seen people disconnect, and, and almost every time they've come up to me and be like, you know, the Lord told me about that, and uh, what's your teaching's okay, but you know what, there's more to it than that. And you know what? I'm sure there is. I don't claim to know everything. I don't claim to be Paul or Jesus or Peter or anybody. I'm just preaching what I feel like the Lord's given me. But if you ever sat in church and you thought God's given me a greater revelation of that, and I'm going to tell you what Christians do a lot. When somebody gives a strong salvation message, a lot of times Christians will unplug from it and go, amen. But that's, you know, I'm already saved. I've heard people go to churches that have soul winning services 
And they go, well, that's good, but all our church does is preach to the lost. I mean, when are they going to preach to me? That's arrogance. Faith doesn't come from having heard, folks. It comes... Uh, it doesn't come from having received a greater revelation. Faith comes from hearing and hearing and hearing. Romans ten seventeen says it. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Brother Hagin said we could put a comma right there and just keep saying, and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And it, what does that mean? It doesn't come from what you've heard or what God showed you in the middle of the night in your greater revelation. You still need to hear the basics and get your faith strong. God poured out his judgment on Jesus, and this is the only reason that God speaks to us at all. Anything good comes from God, period. There is nothing that you're doing to earn it. There's nothing that you're doing that deserves it. Those good looks that God blessed you with, you, you just didn't come out with the genetic gene pool that's perfect. Look at yourself in the morning when you wake up. <laughs> Believe me, sm smell your breath. <laughs> Those talents that you have, those aren't just because you're good. The abilities that you have aren't just because you're that good. It's because God is good, and that is to show how good he is. Whatever it is in your life that is good is a testimony of how good he is. And that's the only reason it's there. You're just born a little bit different. You're just that cool. No, you're not. <laughs> this is how good God is right here. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 9. You parents, if your children ask of a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask of a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you, and I love the fact that he's talking to us here, and he says this, you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those that ask? As good as you think you are, and the good things that you think you can do, you don't even Pale in comparison to the goodness of God. You're a lump of clay that did, had no shape and no form until God gave you life. So the next step is get over yourself. Get real with the creator of the universe who knows you for who you are and what you really can't do. And the shortcomings that you have when nobody is around. And the secret things that nobody else knows. God knows them. He knows about your addictions. He knows about your shortcomings. He knows about your secret sin. He knows about the embarrassing things in your life. And he still loves you. And he still wants to empower you. And he still wants to revive you. And he still wants to give you good things. And he still wants to reach into the worst of circumstances and turn them around for your gain. That's how good God is. Let's move on to the next one. I know I'm going a little bit longer today, but that's okay. The next thing in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. That's where we were, right? 2 Chronicles chapter 7. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, get over themselves, and pray and seek my face. Let's talk about that. Pray. The word pray means to communicate or to ask God. James chapter 4 spells this out so plain. Verse number 2. You want, you want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want. Good Lord, catch that. Because you don't ask God for it. Christians are notoriously guilty at this. I know what I'm supposed to do, and I know that I'm supposed to pray, and I know that God wants to bless me, but yet we don't. 
we have for some time or another thought that it was a replacement of knowing it and doing it. Knowing God wants to bless you isn't enough. Knowing that you're supposed to speak to your mountain isn't enough. Knowing that you're supposed to pray is not enough. We still have to ask. And we still have to pray. And we still need to communicate with God. You know what? Getting saved will keep you from hell, but that's not what builds your relationship. A lot of times people think that the knowledge of God is enough. Like we're going to just pick up things by osmosis. Coming to church is, is going to just magically make things happen for me. This is part of what God's doing in your life. But you have to talk to him. you got to communicate with him. And praying is not just a one-way street where you do all the talking. Praying is a two-way street. Sometimes you can pray by sitting there not saying anything. And let him do all the talking. God doesn't do a lot of uh, uh, things a lot of the time simply because people aren't asking him. John Wesley said this, and this got brought up in our small group the other night. It's a great topic. It seems God is limited by our prayer. That is why it seems he can do nothing unless someone asks him to do it. Now that's a powerful statement right there. And a lot of people immediately go, don't tell me God can't do it. That doesn't mean that God's not able to do it. Listen, we all know that if he chose to, this whole thing would be wiped away. We would have never existed and, and he, he could start over. But why doesn't he? Because he's bound by his own integrity not to. He is only allowed by himself to move and operate by his own rules. And those rules only apply to Christians who ask him. If a Christian asks according to his word, God is obligated to do it. If a sinner asks according to his word, he's not obligated until... Now, he might do it. He might decide to do it. It might be a mercy and, and grace kind of a thing. But listen, he's not obligated to answer the world's prayers. He's obligated to answer yours. Why? First week, you belong to him. If we belong to him, we still have to ask him. You want to get closer to God? You want to have that revelation of when you, when you wake up in the morning and the word makes sense? Ask God to make the Bible make sense to you. You want to feel his presence? Ask God, God, I want to feel your presence. You want to have greater understanding of scripture? Ask God for it. You want to have a closer walk with him? Ask God for it. You want to have a, get a raise at your job? Ask God for it. Some of you want to get a job? Ask God for it. I want to get a promotion? Ask God for it. I want a better marriage? Come on, ask God for it. We have to ask, and a lot of us aren't because we feel that, well, we already know what we need. You have to ask. Lastly, to this week, seek my face. Isaiah 45, 15 says this about God. Truly you are God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. I've talked about this in this church before. God's a God that hides himself. There have been times of grace and mercy where God does things to get our attention. But listen, that's not the norm. And, 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 I've said it, I'm sure many of you have said it. If this is going to happen, God's going to have to really get my attention. He's going to have to slap me right in the face before I will look and see if that. I've actually used this, this one. Uh, I'm going to have to have a hand appear in my bedroom and ride it on the wall and fire. Anybody else ever said something like that? <laughs> Listen to me, I believe there are times that this happens, but this is not the norm. 
God does do things to get our attention, but catch this. Once your attention has been gotten, it's up to you to keep it focused on him. Now, we've been spoiled, to be honest with you, because we go to meetings and we go to church and we go to revivals elsewhere, or we, whatever, and we go where someone else sought God's face for you. And you didn't have to do anything, but yet you felt something. Anybody ever been to one of them big meetings? And you just were in awe of how big everything was and how beautiful the music was. And, and, and oh, look, there they are, the, 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 the person that you came to see, your favorite TV minister. They walk out on stage and you go, oh, there they are. Oh. And you felt the presence of God. And you didn't have to do anything. We, that spoils us because we think we don't have to do anything. God will just move. God will just touch. God will just deliver. God will just minister. The thing is, is this is not the norm, and that's why when people go back home and they're by themselves and they don't feel God's presence anymore, they talk themselves out of whatever God did do in their lives because, well, I don't feel him the same way anymore. Well, it's because somebody else sought his face for you, and they brought him into the presence, and you just happened to be standing right there next to where he was. Just because <clears throat> you're in the presence of someone famous who talked to your friend doesn't mean that you met that famous person. It means your friend did. Let me give you an example of this. I was at the Indy 500 a few years ago. Got great seats. I was in turn two. I was sitting in Tony Stewart's suite right on turn two, literally 15 feet from the track. When the cars went by, you could feel the wind. It was the best, be, best way to watch the Indy 500. My goodness, it was awesome. And I'm sitting there. And uh, it's about two hours before race, what, race time. And so me and my buddy Josh... Uh, who was the director of shipping and receiving at Rama and, and uh, me and him went down to the paddocks and the pits because we had pit passes because we were there. Let me tell you why we were there. This company flew us there. He was in charge of shipping and receiving, so they wanted all of Rama's international shipping, this company did. Everything in Europe and Asia and Africa, they wanted to do all of it. And so they flew us over there, and none of the Hagans could go. So he was like, well, can I take somebody with me? We have two tickets. And the Hagans were like, yeah, who do you want to take? And he goes, well, I think Brent would be good. And they were like, okay. So I got to go to the Indy 500 for free as a VIP. I had pit passes, paddock passes. I mean, we got to go everywhere. We walked around like we owned that place. It was awesome. And so we're standing there in the pits, and I see this crowd of people, like, like this just moving back and forth and coming right for us. And I'm like, somebody's in there. It's one of the drivers. It's somebody. And I'm getting real excited. I'm like, wonder who it is. You know, the cars are right here. It's got to be, you know, who is it? Is it, is it Fittipaldi? I mean, I mean, who, who is it? You know? And so I kind of start, and it, this is when I was still big, Brent, and I still weighed 375 pounds. So I just start pushing people out of the way, and I'm just kind of making my way through. My, my friend's behind me, and he's a little bit smaller than me, and he's walking, and we're just kind of moving people around. And I'm not joking. I pushed about three people out of the way, and I stuck my face around, and bam! George Bush Sr. is like right in my face. And I'm like, it's the president. Now, he wasn't the president then, but uh, he had already been. But he's big. He's like almost as tall as me. I mean, he's a big dude. And I, I was like face to face with him. And I was like, and I literally just handed my, my camera back to Josh like this. I didn't even like just hand it. He, and, and amazingly, he took it. And, and I handed President Bush my, my pit pass and everything, and he signed it, and I just kind of slid up there next to him, put my arm around him. And, and okay, so, so here's, here's, what, here's, here's what happens. I'm, I'm, I'm like this. Let's see, wait a minute. I got to do it this way. I'm like this, looking at him, and I slide around behind him, and I put my arm around him like this, and my friend takes the picture. And I'm like, it's such an honor, sir, to meet you. I shook his hand, and, and you know, where are you from? I'm from Oklahoma. This is when we were living in Oklahoma. Such a great day. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the race kind of a thing. All right, great. So we go back, and Josh is running around telling everybody, we got to meet President Bush Sr. And I'm like, you didn't say anything to him. <laughs> I did all the talking. I shook his hand. All you did was take the picture. He 
told everybody, we met President Bush. We met President Bush. We met President Bush. Thank God I'm the one that has the picture. I have proof. I should have brought it today. <laughs> I got to meet him. Listen to me. This is what happens when you go to church and somebody else is seeking God's face. You are experiencing the whole thing, but you're not interacting with him. You're not meeting him. You're not touching him. He's just in your presence. And you're feeling the side result of somebody else seeking his face for you. But you ain't going to have revival that way. You have to seek God's face yourself. God comes into the presence of people who search for him. And as a side re result, it will affect somebody else. You've got to seek God yourself. And not expect somebody else to. You husbands that, are, that are, are dependent on your wives, stop depending on your wives. Go seek God yourself. You wives that come to church because your husband's a godly man, stop doing it and start seeking God yourself. Those of you who are in relationships where you're here because of somebody else, God wants a relationship with you. You, yourself, you need to seek God so that you can be in the manifested presence of God yourself. When you are, when you are where he is, the life-giving power of God causes your spirit man and your body to change. Let me close with this scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. You've already got half the battle done. All you have to do is seek his face yourself. You want to have the light of God shining out of you? Listen, you're called to. Seek his face. Ask him. Get over yourself. Understand you belong to God. Now next week we're going to wrap this up. But I want to challenge you. Seek God in the car this week. Seek God at home by yourself this week. Pray. Talk to him. Ask him about some things. Listen, just this week I've been talking to a guy that's been coming off and on to church here. His driver's license has been suspended for a year. And I told him, I said, why don't we just really get serious about this? And he did. He's been trying to make small changes where he can and, and, and some things. And he got serious and got a letter in the mail just yesterday, or two days ago. And said, we, 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 we understand your license has been suspended for X, you know, these, these things. But we realized that you haven't been doing this, this, this. And it was, it was in his favor, some of the things he hadn't been doing. So we have issued a, a, a statement to the Department of Motor Vehicles to reinstate your driver's license. Now, why did that happen? Because he prayed and sought God. He stopped complaining. He stopped sitting there just giving himself down. And, oh, woe is me. My life is terrible. All this. Listen, he experienced revival in his life. Why? Because he finally stopped looking elsewhere, got over himself and all of his problems and sought God and asked. This is what God wants to do for you. That's a small victory in some, some people's eyes. To him, it might as well have been $10 million. What is it that's going on in your life that you need revival in? Seek his face. Ask him. Father, we thank you for our time together today. Lord, I know your desire is to move amongst your people, to touch, to heal, to set free, to liberate, to give peace. Father, I pray today, I ask today for revival amongst your people, revival amongst those that are here, revival amongst those that are watching. Father, that they'll be able to experience revival in their lives so that they can shine forth how bright you are. In the name of Jesus. Now, if you're here today, and I know we've gone a little bit long, but I want to just ask you, how much are you asking? 
How much are you seeking? How much of yourself are you listening to? This is not something that is just a, a, a doorstop, and this is not just something that's just a, uh, a, something that we just do. This is a lifestyle. Revival shouldn't, only, shouldn't just happen once a year. Revival shouldn't just happen when you come to church. Revival should be something that's happening all the time. So what are you doing when nobody else is around? Nobody else is there. You're at home by yourself. What are you doing? Talked to somebody this week that was having all kinds of challenges, and I think the exact words they used was, I have to just sing praise and worship all the whole time in order to get through it. That's the right thing to do. What is that? That's bringing revival into your life. This is what you're supposed to do. I ain't got time for that. I got to get my work done. No, you don't. That's a lie. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. If you're here today, you've been <clears throat> listening to yourself. You haven't been praying. You haven't been seeking God. You haven't been seeking his face. Listen, revival starts by accepting what you've done, repenting for it, and moving on. If that's you, you belong to God, you realize it, you know you need to make some changes. If that's you, Right there at your seat, not going to make a big deal out of this, but I want you to just let me know. You're talking to me, Brent. Slip your hand up and say, that's me. I've been listening to myself way too much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I haven't been praying. I haven't been seeking his face. Been listening to myself. Right there at your seat, just lift it up. Just say, it's me. You're talking to me. Yeah, yeah. God sees those hands. He knows. I just want to know who I'm praying with. Because for revival to truly happen, you have to, you have to repent and move on. So today we're going to ask God for forgiveness. We're going to repent from getting, you know, all about us. And we're going to start to experience revival in our lives. Now, if you raise your hand, you know you need to get over yourself. I want you to just tell God you're sorry right now. Lord, I'm sorry for listening to myself. I'm, I'm sorry that I have been all about me. I've been all about what I think. And I'm sorry. I'm over it. I know that the true, <clears throat> true goodness comes from you. And so I'm, I'm looking to you for it now. So if that's you, and you've been, you just pray it right now. Just tell him. Tell him, God, I'm sorry. I'm confessing it right now. I admit it. I have been all about me. All about me. Just tell him. And Father, today I'm making it about you. Your will for my life. Your goodness in my life. I'm making it about you. So that I can change. And the world can change because of me. Now, if we got that straight, let me just ask this. If you're here and you've never had a relationship with Jesus, you've never been born again, you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, listen to me. All of this starts there. By accepting the fact that he died on the cross for your sins. <clears throat> he rose again. When you accept that, man, God can do so much in your life. Because now you belong to him. So if you need to make him Lord of your life today, would you say this prayer with me? Say, Father, I come to you today a sinner, but I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe that you raised him from the dead. And I believe that he's Lord of all. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creature in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer with me this morning, you belong to God now. Your life is not your own. You don't need to seek the answers from yourself. You need to be seeking the answers from Him. When you don't know what to do, He does. When you feel hopeless, He is 
full of hope. <clears throat> and so with that being said, as we take this next to last step for revival, I want you to think about the area of your life right now that you need revival in. I want you to think about it right now. Where is it that you need revival? I don't know. That's up just between you and God. You need an addiction broken? Do you need revival in your marriage? Where do you need revival at? Do you, do you need peace? Where is it that you need revival at? I need to feel God's presence like I did. Okay, wherever that is, whatever that is, as we're here, I want you to seek his face and we're going to ask him this morning for it. We're going to ask him for what it is that you need in your life. What is it that you need revival in? I need a revival at my job, Pastor. I need, I need a better job. I need more money. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you are going to ask him for it today. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And as they sing, play, whatever, I want you to take this moment, just for a few moments right here, and I want you to ask. And I want you to seek his face. Because it's a, yeah, yeah. just seek, just ask. Watch what God wants to do in your life. Watch what he does. Come on, close your eyes, don't look around, don't wait for anybody else. You just start asking him right now. Just start seeking his face right now. Come on, get over yourself. Talk to him. I don't really uh, feel normal, um, you know, doing this in front of everybody else. That's pride talking. Lay it down. Talk to God right now. Close your eyes. Imagine you're the only person in here. Just him. Father, we need, we love you. And so, Lord, we pray right now in Jesus' name for this, whatever it is. You name it. You tell it. I need my, my loved ones to come back to you. Bring them back, Lord. Convict them. Reach into the middle of their situation and touch their heart right now. Come on, I need grace in my life. Whatever it is, come on, don't just sit there. Ask. 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 Come on, they're singing. Nobody else can hear you. Just tell him. Tell him what you need. Tell him what you want. Tell him what the desire of your heart is. Tell him. Come on, don't just sing with them. Talk. Talk to God. He's listening. He's ready. He's ready to touch. He's ready to do it. He's ready. Ask. Ask. Ask.